Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, co-coordinated by Octo and uh, NatureSurf. And I'm standing in today for Lauren Wenzel. Uh, this is part of the NOAA National Marine Protected Areas Center webinar series, which uh, they run alongside with us over here in EBM Tools Network and Octo. Um, and we're very pleased today to have on uh, Steve Giddings and Tom Moore from NOAA, who are going to be presenting today about the Florida Reef Tract Rapid Response um, following Hurricane Irma. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about our presenters. Steve Giddings is Chief Scientist for NOAA's National Marine Sanctuary Program. He was formerly the manager of the Flower Garden Bank's National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, Dr. Giddings has broad experience in conservation science, including ecosystem characterization and monitoring, damage assessment and recovery, and spill response. He has extensive field experience in scientific diving, ROV operations, and submersible use. He did his PhD research in the Florida Keys in the 1980s, studying the recovery of coral reefs following mechanical damage. The damage assessment following Hurricane Irma brings his career back to where it began. Uh, so we'll be interested in hearing more about that, Steve. And we also have on today Tom Moore. Tom Moore is with uh, NOAA's um, in, based in St. Petersburg, Florida. He has nearly 18 years of habitat restoration experience with the NOAA Restoration Center, where he serves as the team lead for coral reef restoration. He's also the co-chair of the Caribbean Coral Restoration Consortium. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. You can type questions into the question panel of the user interface, and then during the moderation, uh, the Q&A moderation after the main presentation, uh, we'll, we'll read those questions to Steve and Tom uh, for responses. So, but feel free to send in questions throughout the webinar, um, and so for us to hit in, in with the questions afterwards. And I will go ahead and turn it over to you now, Steve. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you great. <clears throat> okay, I'll go ahead then. Um, yeah, when I talked about my career coming full circle, this is the kind of work that I did when I first started in uh, in ocean sciences or oceanography, uh, studying a ship grounding site in the Florida Keys. Um, and during that time, a hurricane went through, so we saw a lot of the similar kinds of damage that I'm going to talk about today. But really, I was studying the processes that impact or affect the rate of recovery of a reef following a mechanical damage incident. So uh, this this hurricane was a pretty big example of that. So I uh, got to come full circle, like I said, around after all these years, back to the Florida Keys and back to studying mechanical damage again. So it was quite a privilege, really, for, from my point of view. Um, so <clears throat> I'll talk quick. First, I wanted to mention the um, the people that helped make this rapid response happen because there was quite a large group of folks associated with these different institutions that you see on the screen here. Um, I did want to mention a couple in particular though because they, they really deserve special mention and that was, you see the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation at the top there, a third over from the left. They they gave a grant that enabled this rapid response following, the, um, following Hurricane Irma to take place. Uh, and then, um, I want to mention the Coral Restoration Foundation as well because they administered the project and then provided triage support uh, following the the, the, um, the survey. Um, people in particular, though, that should be called out are Jenny Stein, who served as the chief scientist from Nature Sun, uh, from uh, Nature Conservancy on the cruise. Jenny was our chief scientist, and. Um, Jennifer Moore did a lot of behind the scenes preparation and log logistics for the making the making this expedition possible. Um, and lastly, I'll mention Shay Veeman, who analyzed data for us uh, recently and gave uh, some of the results that I'll show today. It's not a heavy quantitative talk by any means. I just have a couple of graphics, but um, Shay was responsible for analyzing the data that the field team gathered to to uh, and provided that to me. <clears throat> So the, the purpose of this rapid response was partly to, uh, to document the storm impacts in every way, shape, and form that it, they occurred, uh, but not, you know, we could only hit a certain number of sites, so we had to choose what we called high-value sites um, within the southeast Florida, including the Marine Sanctuary and outside it. Um, 
And so we chose high, what we called high value sites based on the levels of visitation and tourism that occur, sort of economic value of places and the representativeness of different habitat types and different reef and other uh, habitat types up and down the, the Keys uh, and beyond. And also there are, there are certain zones that have special management activities or regulations within them in the Florida Keys. And we wanted to choose say, uh, sites to visit that were within some of those zones so we can look at impacts there. And also things related to the history of these sites that were selected, how much data was already, had been collected in the past from them and so forth. You know, what kind of history of research did these places have? So in the end, we selected oh, 100 and something sites and visited in the end 57 different sites throughout the course of um, a couple of weeks cruise. So <clears throat> we wanted to also locate areas that had certain species and certain coral types of corals that were broken, fragmented, damaged or whatever that might deserve some special attention with regard to repairing um, damage that occurred from the storm. So, so that was one of the key things we were looking for at each of these sites we visited. Uh, while we were there, of course, we also took advantage of the opportunity to assess coral diseases, which aren't necessarily related to the storm, but certainly had been being studied because of a wave of disease that was going through the Florida Keys prior to the storm, and also um, assessing reef fish assemblages uh, to build on previous data sets. So those were the main goals of the, of the cruise. We did three different basic approaches in terms of survey uh, techniques. One was more or less a roving diver survey, which is pretty much like it sounds, a diver swimming around, but documenting to the best they could um, the scale of impacts on a pretty broad scale because we did try to cover a lot of ground um, and the severity of those different impacts to the various kinds of species that were affected, whether they be corals, sponges, seagrasses, or uh, the framework itself. Um, we'd also document through these roving diver surveys the disease occurrence uh, and types of types of diseases, the prevalence and so forth, and did as much mostly video documentation as we could, and then we could capture photos off those those videos. So that was one survey technique. Another involved very detailed um, transect uh, counts on 10 meter transects. Uh, using a belt about a meter wide uh, along those transects. And two divers did this did this at each site to get demographic data, in other words, species and types uh, of corals and other things that were on those transects, and to uh, assess the condition of the individual corals, whether they were damaged, diseased, bleached, or otherwise affected uh, by the storm or, or some other factor. So that was the transect surveys. And the third census technique involved um, to, uh, fish censuses that a lot of you are probably familiar with cylinder type counts for for uh, stationary diver fish censuses. So we did those at each station when the visibility was adequate to do it. With that storm, I can tell you the visibility on some sites was oh, a couple meters maybe, um, usually more like five or six or seven meters, but the visibility was really bad following the storm and even a month after the storm when we did the survey. So there were quite a few places where we could not do adequate fish surveys, uh, visual censuses, because there wasn't enough visibility. <clears throat> and this is um, a schematic showing the nature of a given station survey. We'd stop at a, a predetermined location using GPS, um, and divers would get in the water, and two divers would do this is a scheme for, say, two dive teams. But um, if, if we only had two dive teams, one team would get in and do the belt transects, one diver doing each transect. And then but when they were done with that, they could go do roving diver surveys out afterwards. And the other two divers would go in and do fish surveys. And when they were finished with those, would go off and do roving diver surveys. There were, there were a number of times, though, where we had plenty of divers on the boat to where I've three dive teams from each vessel. And we did have two different vessels operating. One was a large boat and the other was a, a day boat. But um, when we had sufficient numbers of divers, we could do three dive teams where one dive team could focus specifically on the roving diver method or um, doing surveys over a very large area and not always staying within the same depth range, but sometimes doing dives down to the deepest parts of the reef and then back up to the original dive site. 
so that you could really cover a lot of ground if you had three dive teams. But that's the approach we used uh, during at each station uh, throughout the course of the, the uh, two-week survey. Um, after each dive, we would uh, regroup on the boat, and um, we actually had a data entry protocol and uh, you know phone-based data entry system where we could enter the kinds of data you see on the screen here, the, the amount of area that had been surveyed by the different divers, the types of injuries that were seen for the different uh, resource types. Um, specifically for corals, we would try to estimate the number and size of corals that were affected by the, by the storm, by the hurricane, uh, and then talk and put in notes about substrate condition, about the presence or absence of rubble that was dislodged by the storm, and whether there was any need or uh, recommendation related to stabilization of that rubble so that the rubble itself wouldn't become projectiles in the next storms and uh, create even more damage than this storm had. Um, we also remarked on the types of debris we saw at the site and whether or not it was storm related debris or, or not. Um, of course, uh, data on types of disease and the prevalence of disease at each station. And then these last two bullets um, were pretty much summary statements about we would we had something we called tiers of damage, tier one, tier two, and tier three, which take into consideration all those above bullets and make an assessment as to whether a given site had more like low, medium, and high levels of storm damage compared to all the other stations throughout the Keys. So that's where we got the tier estimates, and I'll show you the data on that in a minute. And finally, uh, for that location, whether or not stabilization was a recommended post-storm activity so that we could take care of certain high-risk uh, species or corals that had been um, dislodged, uh, overturned, or otherwise damaged by the, by the hurricane. <clears throat> so, um, as I said before, we had two boats. We had a day boat. Uh, well, actually, there were, some, there were two separate activities. Uh, groups working here. There was a group working up north of the Florida Keys while we were doing the, the work in the Florida Keys, but but and that was on a day boat up north. But in the Florida Keys, uh, from Biscayne Bay on down, we had two boats, the Shearwater that you see here on the picture and a small day boat uh, that worked. So really, there are like three different teams almost working throughout the course of this period. Um, and we on our boat, the Shearwater and the Day Boat, we did seven sites within Biscayne Bay National Park and then 50 sites within the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, which uh, extend those, those extended from Key West all the way up to Key Largo. Uh, we didn't go beyond Key West for this expedition. This, so, that, so Hurricane Irma, is, this is an image of it crossing the Southern Keys and shows the location in the Southern Keys where it came across on the 10th of uh, September last year. And first, you know, first thing you'll notice here is how strong the winds were or how much stronger they were on the eastern half of the storm than on the western half of the storm. That's not unusual for hurricanes. Um, and that was certainly the case for this one. Um, this was, I won't go into the details on the storm, but it was one of the strongest hurricanes on record. Um, and it was a Category 5 when it crossed the Leeward Islands in the Caribbean. It was Category 4 by the time it came across the Florida Keys. Um, and it, as you recall, you know, it was two weeks ahead of uh, Maria, which followed in its footsteps across the northern Caribbean. So a lot of the islands were hit again by another hurricane uh, following this, this one. Um, so as far as the continental United States goes, this was the strongest uh, storm since Katrina in 2005. Now just go over quickly some of the breakage types that we saw, some of the damage types that we saw to corals and other things. Um, as in all hurricanes, it seems like there's there's areas where you're going to get various kinds of coral breakage. This one up dislodged some particularly large corals. You can see this pillar coral in the lower left called Dendrogyra. This was a gigantic colony over a thousand pounds in weight, I'm sure, by the uh, estimates of those who restored it or repaired it. But um, this is a very rare coral type right now in the Florida Keys because of loss over the many years. 
a uh, couple decades uh, that corals have been in decline down there. But um, anyway, you can see different kinds of breakages, particularly to the branch colonies in the middle there. That's an Elkhorn coral that used to have probably a lot of arms. And it was very common for us to find these with arms just broken off the corals and laying in the sand around it or, or just completely gone. And then a lot of up, uprighted and overturned corals like this one on the far right. <clears throat> and then, of course, some very large uh, star corals on the left there. You can see one that, uh, that was overturned. Uh, quite a few examples of that on the reefs. And a whole bunch of um, dislodged soft corals and sponges that just were balled up in certain places, certain depressions and certain other uh, depositional areas. Uh, up and down the reef track. Very common to see dislodged uh, corals like that. And these, some of these larger corals are the kinds of corals that you could, you can stabilize in place and uh, keep, you know, keep function, allow them to continue to function in the live form rather than remain in uh, rolling around in the sand and, and dying. So these are the kinds of corals that are not too difficult to um, restore or repair. Looking at the numbers real quickly, um, this histogram shows, if you look at that upper number with the right circle, it says 56%. 56% um, of all the uh, staghorn coral that we found was damaged. Now that's not unexpected in a hurricane because this is a very fragile coral, it's branching and it, it tends to break uh, and recover by reattaching itself to the bottom, the broken pieces do. And actually that's one way it propagates. Uh, but you can see the numbers of encountered Acropora corals on the trans, this is transect data, was fairly low. So Acropora is not doing well in the Keys in general. Um, so we didn't find a whole lot of colonies, but those we did find, most of them were damaged, which um, is one of the species that we, if we find it, we're going to want to repair it because of its uh, vulnerability due to low abundance. On the other hand, if you look down at the the Sideroastria data, three down from there, you can see we found over 2,000 colonies of Sideroastria on uh, transects, but only 10 of those were damaged colonies. So Sideroastria damages at a very low rate, and it's a very high abundant coral on the reefs. Um, those that we did find damaged, which during my surveys that I was doing, the roving diver surveys, I did encounter a lot of them, but they were mostly the large types, and they rolled over, and they could be rolled back upright and and saved if if you wanted to. But because of their abundance, we tend not to do that because they do a functional purpose, even in the upside down form because they create habitat for, for other critters. So we are selective as to what we triage and what we don't. Um, this shows the data again from crop ratio and the, you know, the high relative abundance of damaged colonies versus non-damaged colonies. Uh, and then some of the other species that have a relatively high rate of, um, of damage. Uh, most of the, the three below it are the three, they used to call Montastria, Annularis, Fabiolata, and Frank's eye. Um, but that whole complex of Annularis, um, at least particularly Fabiolata and Annularis, we saw quite a bit of damage to those colonies. <clears throat> then the next um, topic I wanted to cover had to do with damaged and clogged sponges. And this was particularly interesting to me uh, because the, the trends we saw as we went down the Florida Keys uh, from the north to south. In the northern part of the Keys, we saw largely fragmented or, or severed, sheared colonies where the, the storm waves and projectiles that moved around in the water damaged sponges, these big barrel sponges that are so common in the Florida Keys. So you'd find fragmented or abraded sponges all over the place. Um, and then you'd, the further south we went, we saw more and more sheared sponges that had just basically broken off because of storm energy and were rolling around in the sand, uh, but still had a chance to recover from the whatever tissue remained attached to the reef. Farther down yet, the middle portion of Florida Keys, we started encountering these lesions that you see uh, in the lower right. And that's, um, if you can see my cursor, it's on a, a lesion there right in the center of the lower right, I mean, sorry, lower left hand picture. And if you were to reach in and touch that white tissue, it would just simply crumble in your fingers. 
the rest of it, the red tissue would be good and hard and actually healthy. But those lesions were became more and more common the farther south we went and seemed indicative of probably clogging of sediment in the sponge and sediment that was sucked into the sponge during the storm uh, because sponges are constantly filtering water through their tissues. And uh, in the weeks following the storm, those sediments did not dissipate and probably led to the uh, clogging and suffocation of some of the tissue on those sponges. And then we got down to the area of uh, in the lower keys, um, an area about 10 or 15 miles across in which most of the sponges that we saw were completely clogged and, and almost and just dead. That lower right shows the mortality entirely of a, of a sponge. And that was very, very common in the lower Florida Keys to see that. So I'll, I'll show you a graphic in a second that shows you the trends uh, along the keys that uh, correlated with those different kinds of damage. Another type of damage had to do with um, sand movement, which sand movement by itself is not all that important unless it lands on top of you. And that did happen in some places. Uh, but removal of sand from huge areas uh, at the bases of reefs or even up on the reefs caused these gigantic whiteout areas where you'd swim along the bottom and there'd be nothing growing, nothing there at all other than just bare bottom. Uh, and sometimes that sand had moved and you could find it. Like in the upper right, we found a, a sand dune on top of a reef that had moved up the reef from the previous spot where it had been. So we got sand migration that we were able to document in a number of places. And then in shallow water, oftentimes the sand removal would just result in the exposure of ancient rubble, uh, which was really beautiful to see, especially if you're a geologist, because you expose old parts of the reef that hadn't been seen in many, many years. In some cases, we even saw undermining, as in the bottom right here, where all the sand had been removed from features, even underneath the features, and sometimes those features would collapse, so we would get framework uh, damage as a result. Coral burial of one form or another was very common, um, either colonies being covered by corals or, uh, I mean, by sand, or in a lot of cases, we'd see just little pieces of Gorgonian corals, sea fans and so forth, sticking up through the sand because of sand migration that had buried most of the colonies. Um, fractured reef framework was something that became, was more common in the areas of higher damage levels of destruction, and uh, that being the Florida Southern Keys. We'd get two types of framework damage. One I just mentioned before, where you get undermining of the sediments and then the, the reef would crack and fall uh, and break open basically. Uh, another type we saw was these little look like landslide areas where the reef framework on top would be broken by the storm energy and anything underneath it that was not consolidated, fully consolidated, would just drain out and create these little landslides of shell and other material that make up the reef itself, the framework of the reef. So it exposed the under the underbelly of the reef uh, in those places. Sediments be, were, as I mentioned with the sponges, a big problem. You can see in the upper left an image from two days after the storm crossed the Keys showing the levels of sedimentation coming out of Florida Bay and hanging out over the reef itself. If 100% of that the Florida Keys reef track there is pretty much covered with, with sediments, or at least uh, by water containing high levels of sediment. Visibility is probably almost zero for, for those days. And you can see typical visibility on the lower left here during our trip a month later. So it was still very bad visibility, uh, resulting in high levels of um, a veneer of, th sometimes thick veneer of sediments on top of corals and other parts of the bottom. And then in many places on the upper right, you can see these deposits of super fine sediments that seem to result from deposition, either of, of sediments that came out of Florida Bay or migrated in from other places, deeper water possibly from the energy of the storm moving uh, deep water currents around or deep water sediments around. <clears throat> storm debris, super common throughout the entire Florida Keys. Uh, most of it related, I have to say, to traps and uh, gear associated with traps, like lines. Uh, you would find pieces of lobster traps and line everywhere. So a lot of opportunities for reef cleanups uh, 
following the storm, obviously. And in one case, even an entire mangrove tree out on the reef, on Conk Reef near Aquarius Habitat, uh, wrapped up with three lobster traps that were still fishing because the traps themselves had not been broken open. So a lot of ghost fishing going on with traps that um, that didn't break but but are not attached anymore to the surface and can't be found by fishermen. So um, just to finish up with the tiers, uh, revisiting the tiers of damage, these are all the sites we visited during the first couple of weeks following, or during the expedition. And like I said, it's a month after the storm. And we classified them as tier one, two, or three uh, with regard to the levels of damage. And tier one being the levels of high destruction. I have a map here that summarizes my impression, my interpretation of all the damage I saw, whether it was corals, sponges, algae, uh, or other things, um, and puts it into a summary statement about the, the areas of where there's low, medium, and high levels of damage throughout the Keys. The storm track you can see crossing in the western or portion of this, the left side of this diagram, uh, the area that that crossed had extremely high levels of damage, um, and this was just off Cujo Key in the southern Florida Keys. But on either side of that, levels dropped relatively well very fast on the west you can see it's back to low levels of damage by the time you get to key west which is just a 10 or 15 20 miles maybe to the west of the areas of high damage but to the northeast you can see it's a much more gradual decline in damage levels uh, owing to the wind speeds that were experienced on the right hand side of that storm as I, I pointed out in the beginning and then as the sponges go you can see the upper Florida Keys had was dominated by the types of damage I described as abrasion and shearing of sponges. The middle keys had a lot more lesion levels of activity, which is a more clogging and mortality type of damage to the sponges. And then the southern keys in the red area there had high, very high levels of suffocation across most of the lower keys. And that why it's not just a function of the strength of the storm going through there. I think it has to do with the orientation of the islands uh, in the southern keys being different than those in the northern keys. You can imagine a lot more sediments are encumbered and, and trained by all the mangroves and the islands in the southern keys. So as the water flow continued to come out through the Florida Bay in the weeks following the storm, probably carried with it a lot more sediments that are much more prolonged and heavy level than the upper keys. And that's probably why the sponges experience such continuous, you know, levels of sedimentation and suffocated as a result. <clears throat> After the storm, we saw, as a lot of people do in many different kinds of damage, uh, blooms of algae that you tend not to see very often. This is a species that, um, that a lot of people have reported when we put it out you know, on the web after the storm and said, hey, we're seeing this bloom. Uh, has anybody else seen it? Well, I got a lot of responses from many people saying, oh yeah, well, that's very common. We see it uh, in a lot of different places after a lot of different types of damage, whether it's ship groundings or, or storms. So now that reports, I talked to Spencer Slate this morning about this and he says that it seems that that abated relatively quickly after it started. So we just saw that bloom about five, four or five weeks after the storm and um, it's not apparently continuing as, as it was then. And a couple quick comments just on side observations of lionfish, which uh, most of you know are a big problem throughout the, throughout the Caribbean. Uh, in the Florida Keys, their abundances are not extremely high in shallow waters, but we only saw 13 of the entire cruise at 57 different stations, which surprised me, I have to say. Um, so whether lionfish move to deep water during storms and hang out there for a while afterwards or not. I, I just don't know, but um, some people have suggested that that's possible. Uh, but the six diadema, the black spine, long spine sea urchins, uh, only seeing six of those on so many dives that we did and so many people in the water, uh, that was a surprise as well. But it's really just, um, it just is continuing evidence of the continued lack of recruitment of this species since the uh, mass mortality back in 1983. So yeah. sea urchins are not doing well at all. <clears throat> but I will say, in the course of tipping corals back over, I flipped up one coral and lo and behold, right beneath it was a big old fat diadema. Uh, 
and two other sea urchins and two fish and a couple of brittle stars, which really was revealing to me because it just showed me how important the creation of new habitat can be following a storm. So storms have important beneficial effects to reef assemblages, uh, even though they tend to kill corals sometimes and other things. So it's something we needed to keep in mind and when we made our decisions about triage and whether or not to be moving corals around once they've created this new condition following the storm. And we want to be very selective in our triage efforts so that we're not disturbing other communities that are depending on storm damage for their proliferation. And you know, any of you who are in the science field know that there's there are theories about intermediate levels of disturbance being very important for ecosystems to promote biodiversity. And I think that's one of the things we're seeing in this storm. We saw very typical, I'd say, types of damage in this storm, even though they were extreme in some places. Uh, but they're typical in the sense that it's a natural event and the, the reef is responding to it in natural ways. So we need to balance our consideration of, um, you know, what we feel like as managers we'd like to help fix versus things we probably should leave behind. So I'll just leave you with that thought as we move on to Tom, because I know he's got things to say about that as well, but he's also going to cover all the triage uh, work that was done following this damage assessment. So Tom, you want to take it from here? Absolutely. So let me just get things kicked off here. Hold on one second. All right, you guys have my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Um, let's see, I'm seeing uh, split, and this may be me. I'm, I'm seeing the triage tiers defined, but I'm also seeing some of your background. Oh, that's not good. OK, hold on one second. Let me deal with that. Of course, it worked during the test, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, how's that? Um, I, it doesn't look like it's in presentation mode. <laughs> oh. Uh oh. All right, give me 30 seconds. Okay, so okay. okay, no problem. Um, let's see, so. Questions there, or anything, man? Okay, um, I will go ahead. We had a couple questions that had come in actually before the webinar. One, I think you've addressed to some extent, but let me, okay, the other one. Pull it up. Uh, while researching hurricane impact, could you make any observations, draw any conclusions on reef and subsurface vegetation damages from incidents like Miami Port Deep Dredge or the most recent cyanobacteria blooms? Not, not specifically with regard to those two things, although when you first started asking that question, I did realize I had not talked about the impacts of the storm on algae. So I hate to divert the answer, but um, I probably should say something real quickly about the fact that this hurricane did seem to remove extensive amounts of benthic algae from the reef, and that has not really come back, which is a good thing because algae tends to inhibit recruitment. Um, and why it hasn't come back, why the benthic algae hasn't come back that existed before the storm, we're not too sure, other than it might be winter and maybe the water's cooler, and maybe it will come back when the water warms up. But for now, at least, the reef seems to be in a better condition, possibly, because of the removal of the folios algae that, that had been growing so prominently on the reefs. Um, there was also obvious impacts here and there to seagrass obvi uh, in shallow water, um, although not as much damage as you might have expected. It seemed like uh, some of the areas that we surveyed were almost had been like the grass was mowed where the tops of the seagrass was broken off, but there was still obviously you know, a couple inches of seagrass sticking out of the bottom. So it will recover just fine. Um, but there were definitely impacts on algae. But uh, unfortunately on those two specific issues that you mentioned, I don't have any information. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we'll go back to Tom, but actually there were some follow-up algae questions which we can hit in the Q&A. Okay. Great, all right, hopefully you guys got me now. Um, apologies for that. 
the so I'm going to jump in here back to kind of the the triage and the, the tiers that we use. So the approach here, as Steve mentioned, was to do a twofold effort here. One was to get an overall handle and kind of big picture view of the impact to the reef system. And the second part of it was to identify the places where it made sense to do some stabilization and some triage. As Steve said, not in all cases does that make sense, but in some cases it, it certainly does. And it's a, it's a proactive thing we can do in the context of some of the other stressors that are ongoing. So as we talked about here, the, the primary impacts uh, that we saw were to these tier one sites. The tier one sites tended to concentrate in the middle keys area as, as would be expected. We also had impacts to other locations throughout the, the reef track as well. But for the most part, we really only considered and prioritized doing triage at the tier one sites and a handful of the tier two sites. Uh, triage out of the survey, out of the 57 sites that were visited, triage was recommended at 14 of those sites. Um, and then there was an additional five sites that were recommended for triage uh, based on other surveys. And one point of context that I want to make, Steve noted earlier, a lot of breakage associated with Acropora cervicornis. And if folks were looking closely at that chart, they may have noticed that Acropora palmata or other major branching species in the Keys was a little bit lower on the list. One, one of the reasons for that is actually we had previously surveyed a number of the palmata sites as part of an emergency effort before the storm and didn't concentrate as much of the assessment crew's work on those sites because we had already done some of that work. So just the, the sites that had high prevalence weren't actually sites that those teams visited as much. And so we did have five additional sites that were recommended for triage that were primarily focused on a crop palmata that we had from other information. Um, and so before I get into kind of what we did, I want to talk a little bit about why, why triage is important and, and when it's important. So there's really kind of two contexts that we think a lot about triage for. One is for our branching species, the Acropora palmata and the Acropora cervicornis. These are corals that as many folks on the phone know, we already do a lot of restoration work with. We put a lot of resources into kind of rebuilding these corals. These are corals that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. They are some of the predominant reef builders in the Florida Keys and throughout the Caribbean and provide a lot of great fisheries habitat as well as ecosystem services and wave breaks. And so because we put a lot of efforts into their restoration already and grow them in a nursery environment and things like that, storms often, they do two things. One is they provide a natural way for these corals to move around on the reef, and that's a good thing, and we want that to continue to happen. But in many cases, the corals end up like, they, like these corals here in the kind of the upper left picture here, where they're down in the sand, they're on the rubble. These corals are, you know, they're going to survive a little bit. They may survive even to the next major wave event, but they're not going to survive long term. Those are the types of corals, at least for these branching species, that provide a real ideal opportunity for doing triage with. Because instead of growing those corals in the context of a restoration environment where we may put a year's worth of work and multiple uh, person hours into growing those corals and doing nursery work for them and caring for them, and then ultimately putting them back onto the reef, we're in many cases left with those same size corals that we would have outplanted through a restoration effort scattered around the sand, scattered around the seagrass, and available for us to do restoration with and triage with in this case. And so this picture here is a time series from some work we did in Puerto Rico during a major wave event uh, in 2008. And you can see kind of the same coral, and there's numerous examples of this, you know, kind of carried through over time as to how just kind of rescuing these kind of quote-unquote outplant size or restorable size corals work. And so that was one of our major focuses here, really was looking at these corals that were down in the sand. And in many cases, it's as simple as kind of taking those corals and bringing them out of the sand, shoving them in a crevice and letting them go. In some cases, a little bit more mechanical reattachment is necessary. Um, the, the other piece of this was kind of thinking about more proactive uh, stabilization and reattachment of these corals. So where we could attach them with epoxy or things like that to the system. Um, and then thinking about dealing with these bigger, larger corals. So as I talked about the branching corals, the branching corals provided us a lot of opportunity for uh, dealing with those kind of corals that we would traditionally restore. The other focus of our triage work was real on these big, large, massive boulder corals. These are the corals that aren't corals that are typically part of our restoration programs. These are corals that are not part of our restoration programs because they take hundreds, a multiple hundreds of years to grow on their own. And these corals have, in many cases, survived 
many of the bouts of disease and, and uh, bleaching and things like that that have hit these environments, and they've only just been recently overturned or dislodged as a result of these storms. These are corals that uh, if they're simply upside down and in a position that they can be righted or stabilized, present themselves as great opportunities for kind of continuing uh, uh, the, the lineage of a particular coral that was maybe uh, resilient to many of these other kind of outside perturbations that were going on. So this also became kind of a big aspect of our work that we were doing. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but I want to jump into here for a moment just kind of how we actually organized ourselves and, and got things going. So the, the strategy that we used here was kind of a, a, a kind of a two-tiered approach. We had the assessment team out in the field doing their work. We had, were doing ad hoc assessments as well. As that information kind of came in to those of us on land that were kind of uh, serving as a little bit of air traffic control, we then had a series of triage teams that were kind of mobily based uh, both in the Southeast Florida region as well as in the Florida Keys. And the thought then was that we got that information from the vessel, uh, we would then assign those teams for the next day or two's worth of work to high priority areas. And so that was generally the strategy that we took for the first few weeks of this as the operation was underway and we had both efforts underway. And then as we gained a, bit, a bigger picture sense of where the impacts were at, we were then able to kind of direct those resources into those particular areas to focus on that work. The, the teams that did the triage work were, were a combination of, uh, of kind of what I would call skilled volunteers. So folks that were coming in maybe from outside the context of normal agencies that were involved in the management realm, but also folks that had an extensive amount of training in other skill sets and other fields. Um, and then uh, some of our core partners at groups like the Florida Aquarium, uh, the Coral Restoration Foundation, and others provided a key amount of their staff to actually staff this effort, combined with NOAA personnel and a number of other partners throughout the region. And we'll revisit those again at the end because we couldn't have done it without them. A key part of this work, though, and as Steve mentioned earlier, was really talking with folks about what constituted a triageable coral. You know, we didn't want, if corals were upside down and had kind of formed themselves into a new position and there was still tissue showing and it was clear that the other tissue that wasn't showing that was buried in the sand was dead anyways, those weren't corals that we were looking to remobilize and move and stabilize just for the purposes of doing it. We really wanted to concentrate on things that were still loose, were still likely had viable live tissue on them upside down. Often cases, those were things that were in crevices and things that were kind of one wave event away from either being continued to be scoured or otherwise damaged. So as I mentioned earlier, in some cases, we actually did mechanical reattachment or we used epoxy and things like that to stabilize things further uh, for kind of the smaller to moderate sized corals. And then as we talked about the larger corals, that really became a context of really trying to just get these things upright and stabilized and maybe put a little bit of cement underneath them. We were fortunate as part of this effort uh, to have, an, have the opportunity to work with a relatively new organization, Force Blue, which is a group of uh, former military and special operations combat divers that received an extensive amount of like high, uh, high intensity dive training in complex environments and have a lot of experience lifting, frankly, very heavy stuff around underwater. And so when we had the opportunity to work with them, it became a very uh, natural fit to have them focus and work on really helping stabilize some of these massive boulder corals. And so we're able to use some of their skill sets to get some of these things flipped over underwater appropriately and safely, move to appropriate positions on the reef and restabilize just either in place or using some mechanical stabilization with cement. Uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, we had the opportunity, there was in one case a, a very large iconic pillar coral uh, located at the Marker 32 reef near Key West. It was one of the only corals actually damaged at that site, but it's a coral, a coral that a lot of folks have done a lot of research on for a long time. Uh, its position on the reef was very iconic. Unfortunately, it was damaged as a result of this storm. And this became a case of a, of, of a coral that was it's a one-off coral, but it's a coral that had had a lot of research done on in the past, so there's high research value. There's a massive amount of tourism value associated with this particular coral as well. A number of dive boats go to this particular site to dive and swim around this particular coral. And when it was knocked down, that really kind of presented a, a real impact to those folks there. And so we were able to 
you know, go in with these guys here and, and lift this thing off the bottom, which was, while it looks relatively small in this picture, in the context of things, this coral, I can tell you from seeing it firsthand, was kind of the, the size of a small Volkswagen. And so it, uh, it certainly was something that was a, a bit of a complicated lift, but was something that we were able to get lift up and moved and reattached. So, and then in many cases, we also had a situation where we had a lot of these just kind of smaller, moderate corals. And so in these cases, these corals were out in the sand, uh, often upside down or kind of rolling around. And in these cases, our, our original plan was to kind of cache these together into single places and then come back and do some reattachment. Um, as I'll talk about in a minute, weather really hampered us doing that. And so in most cases, many of these were just kind of brought back up onto hard substrate, wedged in place. And uh, we believe based on past experience in many cases where we've got some of that tissue in contact with other substrate that they'll start to uh, attach themselves naturally. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, weather did end up being a major challenge for us. This is un unfortunately, you know, it took us a couple of weeks to get this, uh, this operation funded and off the ground, which put us primarily in the field in the October, November, and December timeframe, some of the absolute worst times of the year to do field work in the Florida Keys. Uh, we were fortunate to have moderate weather conditions for the assessment crews, but uh, weather really deteriorated thereafter. And we lost uh, probably more than 50% of the days that we had actually teams mobilized on the water uh, to do triage work, we lost to weather. And then we lost numerous weeks in between those completely to weather where we knew it wasn't even worth mobilizing the efforts. So unfortunately, uh, while we had a lot of resources in place and we certainly uh, did our best to do a lot of great work uh, down there, we only were able to really stabilize and reattach around 2,000 corals. We had really hoped for a much larger number from, than that. And as you can see here, there are a number of sites where there was work was completed or a number of sites where kind of resources were desired, but we weren't able to get them there or things were partially completed. We're still very happy with the results. Unfortunately, the weather window didn't allow us to kind of get as much done as much as we could. And as anybody that does this kind of work knows, you know, if you continue to have bad weather after these events, uh, while you can gain maybe a month or two months even where you've got these corals still alive and, st and stable, often after that, things start to succumb. So we were not able to do as much as we would have ultimately liked to do due to the weather, but are still very happy with what we were able to do. And we're happy that we were able to concentrate our resources really on those branching corals that I talked about earlier that kind of provide the next generation and provide a really low cost opportunity for restoration, as well as on some of these bigger iconic corals uh, that represent you know, hundreds of years worth of services. So uh, the next steps here are really uh, starting to, and this is more for the, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and other resource managers to start thinking about how some of the marine debris that was identified in this area can, can, can be removed. And then those of us in the restoration community are beginning to think through you know, how we can incorporate uh, the lessons learned of this storm on coral restoration infrastructure, which fared moderate in different places and took different degrees of hits to make sure that is in a good condition to withstand future events and that we can concentrate restoration on reefs where it is most appropriate uh, based on some of these impacts. One of the other uh, observations kind of from a, just a broader coral restoration standpoint that we had here is as many folks know that fallow coral reef restoration, the predominant species that we've used quite a bit is the Acropora cervicornis, the staghorn coral, um, and that was a great coral for many of us to kind of quote unquote learn restoration on over the last decade or so and has, and has done a great job for us in terms of restoration. But as Steve noted earlier in this talk, that was certainly a coral that was very highly susceptible. We knew going into it, it's highly susceptible. It's a coral that moves around during storms naturally. But one of the things we've certainly uh, that's hit home here for the restoration community and we're already taking active changes to make sure this takes place is to need to have a much greater emphasis on other species, including Acropora palmata, which just over the last couple of years has really proven to be a coral that is just as restorable for us as the staghorn coral. And so are working with partners throughout the region now as they rebuild their restoration infrastructure to put a greater emphasis on that coral, both because of its lasting power after storms like this as well as its ability to provide more coastal protection from them. So 
Uh, with that, I'll just wrap up with a few comments before we take questions on the Southeast Florida work. That work is still is just kind of just getting wrapped up right now. The impacts there were not as severe from the actual physical uh, removal of reef and damage of the reef itself. It's not to say it didn't exist there. It certainly did. Um, their impacts there were mainly around the, uh, the remobilization of rubble and movement of rubble onto particular reefs and on some of the uh, a cropper server cornice of staghorn patches kind of receiving a haircut as they typically would after these storms and some debris becoming entangled in, within those areas. Triage needs were much less limited, uh, were very limited in that region as well. But it's important to note that uh, while the storm-related impacts were not that severe within that particular region, the impacts overall to the reef in, that were identified during their surveys do not paint a very good picture at all. The ongoing disease events, which a number of our colleagues are on another call right now talking about uh, in that region, continues to have resulted in significant mortality uh, to all species of corals, but including some of the large framework building corals in the region. So with that, I want to give a second shout out, as Steve did in the beginning, to all the partners. This was an effort that we literally pulled together uh, after a conversation that took place in the middle of one week on a Thursday afternoon. And by the next Monday, we were turning and burning with, you know, 20 people on phone calls trying to get this put thing pulled together, cranking a lot of logistics and moving a lot of moving pieces uh, to make this happen in short order. Thank you very much to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, as Steve mentioned earlier, which really stepped up with some critical funding to cover some of the core costs and the Coral Restoration Foundation, which stepped up to really be our fiduciary agent. But all of the partners here from the Florida agencies of DEP and FWC uh, throughout the NOAA team and all of our university partners in the region and our other federal partners and the various aquariums and academic institutions noted here, this was an all teams on our all hands on deck effort. And uh, there are too many people to thank individually, but uh, you know who you are, and this could not have been done without you guys. So thank you, and we'll hopefully have a few minutes for questions here. Okay, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Steve. Um, just to reiterate, we, we do have a couple of minutes for questions, and I will be able to provide the questions to the presenters, even if we aren't able to get them to to, the, to them today. So please go ahead and send in your questions um, right now through the question panel, uh, just by typing them in. Um, a question, uh, there was a comment that had come in, and I think this was relative to the algae, but Steve, you might need to interpret for me. It says, just FYI, as of December, we are starting to see small shoots of dictyota mm -hmm. uh, emerging on reefs in the Keys, and that's from Katie Cummings with um, FWC, the, the Coral Reef Evaluation and Monitoring Program. Yeah, yeah, Dictyota is one of those that was a pre-existing common, very common species uh, that was <clears throat> starting to, well, it was, it's common on most of the reefs now. It used to not be so common before the sea urchin die off, but um, yeah, interesting to hear. So, so Dictyota is starting to make a comeback, which as we suspect indicates that others will as well. Um. Um, there was a question, are there plans for similar assessments in the U.S. Caribbean? Did they so, say are there? Um, oh. I, I, can, I can take that. I think I yeah. know some of the answers. So, um, so we, uh, to date, have been doing some ad hoc assessments uh, throughout Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands to inform triage needs in those areas. Uh, due to some of the logistics post the Hurricane Maria there, we weren't able to get a super organized uh, assessment effort off the ground right after the storm and did move some of those efforts straight into triage given the time considerations. We are at this point uh, revisiting and working with some federal partners to look for some resources to do a similar type of assessment there. It is not yet funded though, um, and, but we're cautiously optimistic we may have some additional resources there. Otherwise, I think the expectation is that we will hopefully pick up some of this data through some of the ongoing uh, monitoring efforts that are done by both the uh, Commonwealth and the territory, as well as through the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see. Uh, there, there are people asking how they can help with uh, future assessments. Um, do they get in touch with you guys? Or, and also people interested in knowing more about the methods and doing them for other places that have been hit. Somebody in Jamaica has, has inquired. 
So I'll, I'll take the first part of that in terms of how people can help and get involved. Um, on this particular effort, we reached out to a kind of a variety of different networks that we had in the region to kind of look for people to help. And uh, we got a, a moderate response. Um, the part of the problem was, is, you know, when everybody wants to help, but unfortunately, when kind of the call goes out, often people are not actually available. So uh, a couple of different options there for kind of getting involved to help uh, that I would say here. One is if you're interested in kind of helping further on the coral restoration front, uh, we have formed a restoration consortium in the career in the U.S. Caribbean, sorry, in the broader Caribbean. And so you can find more information on that at reefresilience.org. It's a, that's a website that we use. And underneath that, there's a restoration section. And within there, there's a section on the consortium. And you can sign up for our mailing list there. If there's an, ever an opportunity like this again, uh, certainly we will be looking for resources through that. And that's a good opportunity to kind of learn more about restoration and things like that as well. We have a series of webinars through that, a series of working groups. It's actually a working group starting their meeting in just a few minutes here talking about in-water coral nursery that are part of that. So feel free to sign up to be part of the consortium. As far as the methods used for this, uh, we certainly have them available in the protocols that were used. Uh, we haven't discussed exactly the best way to distribute those to others. Um, certainly they would could be available on a one-off basis, but Steve, I'll let you maybe address whether or not you think there's a, a better opportunity to share some of the details of the methods. Yeah, I mean, certainly we're willing to share whatever anybody would like if they need help coming up with method ideas. But I was, what my point with it would be, um, we didn't really invent new methods to to do this kind of work. We tried to and tried to revisit some, and tried to use some of the similar methods that people have used in the past to study these particular areas, so that we would have data that could be compared directly with prior research. So I would encourage you all first to think about using assessment or population, you know, a census type um, techniques that are already used in the place that the damage occurs uh, as a first uh, choice. And if it's needed, if you feel like you need to incorporate other methods that don't already exist in those places, we'd be more than happy to offer up whatever we can in terms of um, protocols or even data management um, tools to help you uh, work through it. Okay, great. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Tom. Um, I'll, we're just going to handle one more question, I think. And is uh, can you discuss how the rapid response is may transition to longer term monitoring and being incorporated with the coral reef management program in the area? Well, part of that is the fact that we used people who are already involved with those programs and um, are using techniques that, like I just said before, are already in place. Um, we have not had any, at least I haven't been involved in any discussions since the damage assessment crews with the programs to see whether any of the data that, or wh whether we want to transition any of the information that we gathered directly into their monitoring programs. Um, so I wish I had a full answer for that, but I really don't. But I do I'll hope that, one, I mean, I'd, oh, go ahead, Tom. I, I said I'll add, I'll add one piece to that, and that was a core part of the protocols that were used were part of the Florida Reef Resilience, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the Florida Reef Resilience Program's disturbance response monitoring effort. And so those uh, were looking to, you know, try to incorporate that data into that longer term monitoring program about disturbance response. And so all the data was collected to be compatible with that particular program. And actually, Jenny Stein, who was our chief scientist, actually helps coordinate that program. So certainly it'll be plugged in through that mechanism and, you know, kind of present a more comprehensive view. And then uh, I guess I would say that I, I, I have no doubt that, you know, the team from the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, you know, is thinking closely about the results of this and the impacts of this as they work through their kind of rezoning efforts and thinking through uh, what makes the most sense for the management of the sanctuary resources kind of in the context of this particular disturbance. Okay. Thank you, guys. All in, right. In the I... sanctuary, we, we have... Oh, go ahead. No, no. Finish, Steve. Uh, can I just say quickly that we have, we have had discussions in the sanctuary about revisiting some of these specific locations where we found particularly interesting uh, 
types of damage, like I said before, the sponge mortality and these heavy sediment deposit areas to see how they evolve post-storm. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, so w there was also a comment that folks in the Keys can get involved by joining up on the marine debris cleanup program in the planning stages. Uh, and the, the contact is Marley Tumalo at the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Upper Keys office. So thank you to Lori who sent that in. Um, and then one, one last question um, quickly, because a couple of people asked, is it possible to get uh, a copy of the detailed assessment report or any sort of final report from this work? It certainly will be that those haven't been produced yet. So I think upon production of those, they will be certainly shared. Okay. okay. Well, thank you both so much for, for both for this work and for speaking about it today. Um, we, I mean, I look forward to hopefully good news about recovery efforts and seeing how the, the reefs are faring in the future. Um, and thank you guys so much for sharing all this with us today. Yep, yeah, we'll go ahead and sign off. And thank you, everyone, for, for, for coming today. We appreciate your attendance.